We can have a forecast that isn't a matter of days or weeks, short-term forecasting. We can have forecasts that are a matter of years, tens of years, five years or tens of years, five to ten years. Or we can have forecasts which are effectively, again, a hazard map, which are really a 50-year time frame or so. Historically, many attempts have been made to do earthquake forecasting. However, today we are as close as we ever will be. And the reason is that we, in my opinion, and the reason is that today we collect more information about where and when earthquakes occur in terms of small events than we have. We used to rely on earthquake forecasting to be done using large events. We would say that we know how often a magnitude 6 occurs. We're going to look for particular kinds of signals before that magnitude 6 or 7 or 8, and we are going to then try and forecast based on that. That's very hard to do, and it was extraordinarily unsuccessful because we have very poor statistics on magnitude 6 events. We have very poor statistics on magnitude 7s or magnitude 8s because they occur so infrequently. However, we have lots of information about magnitude 3 events because they occur so often. They occur 100,000 more often than a magnitude 5 event, for example. So we can collect a lot of statistics and we can use those statistics to tell us something about earthquake forecasting, about when the next earthquakes are likely to occur. And I'm going to show you examples of that in a few minutes. So, again, we, could, we record today 500,000 earthquakes per year worldwide and 10,000 in Southern California alone. Those are small events. They're not big ones. They're the ones nobody feels. But I'm going to say this again, that most of those small events are going to be used as a sensor for the larger events that are coming. We're going to assume that those small events are telling us something about the underlying seismicity. They're acting as a stress sensor. I'm sorry, the underlying stress. They're acting as a stress sensor. They're telling us where stresses are increasing or decreasing. It's not a simple problem. It's a complicated one. But it, 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 at, its, at the first order, at the zeroth order effect, you can assume that seismicity rate changes, changes in the number of events we have, are a reaction to changes in stress. As a result, we're going to then use those to suggest where upcoming events might happen because those also react to the same stresses. It's just that it takes them longer. So, again, this is a forecast map we made over 10 years ago now. It was to forecast earthquakes from 2000 to 2010. That's the one on the left. And um, Again, earthquakes greater. So again, it's like it's a forecast. Earthquakes greater than magnitude five from 2000 to 2010, and all those red and orange and yellow spots are locations where earthquakes are expected to happen over the next 10 years. And if you look at that map, I've overplotted on it all the earthquakes of magnitude five and greater that happened in the 10 years following 2000. And you will also notice that there are only two misses numbers 7 and 8, there are 39 earthquakes on that plot, 39 earthquakes greater than magnitude 5, and all of them are on or near <coughs> in the margin of error we specified, which was incidentally 10 kilometers. So within 10 kilometers, they all fall within one of those anomalies. That's not bad. There's a fair number of false positives. The biggest problem with any one of and, and with any earthquake forecasting technique, this or any other, is the issue of false positives. Okay, you're always going to forecast some earthquakes that never happen, and you can see that we do have a relatively high false positive right here. It's about 20 percent. But you'll also notice that again, we only have two misses. But in addition, there's a very large part of that map in which we say there aren't going to be any earthquakes. Okay. And that is a benefit to a method like this because it can tell you where you need to put your resources in the next five to ten years. Where should you be upgrading your gas lines? Where should you be re um, reinforcing your school roofs? Okay. Where should you be doing those kinds of things over the next intermediate, it's what we call intermediate term, over the next intermediate term? And again, we think that this was reasonably successful if you look at it from that perspective. On the right, 
you have um, a hazard map. And the reason I put this up is this is, again, what engineers use to build a building. This is a 10% uh, probability of exceeding a certain um, acceleration due to gravity. And again, you'll notice that there are lots of colored areas on this. And this is what we use for building codes. This means that sometime in the next 50 years, there's a 10% chance that um, Los Angeles is going to experience an acceleration, a jump, that's about 80% of gravity. So 10% chance that in 50 years, that's what it's going to see. I would tell you that I, well, anyway. So the real issue there is the, what they use these for is they use these to build buildings that won't fall down when that 80% when that of gravity holds up. Okay, it's a building code requirement. So this is, again, that same map. So it's just to outline what we've done here. And to remind you that what we want to do here is, is, what we are doing here is assuming, again, it's that first line that's most important, that small earthquakes are acting as the sensors for the large events, acting as a sensor for the stress changes that, <coughs> that occur prior to large events. So again, to make this map, we only use earthquakes of magnitude three and above. Okay, so again, we use, there are approximately 25,000 or so that occurred in the last 30, that we have recorded, I should say, in the last um, 30 years in California, magnitude three and above. So that's what we use for to create that. Yes? Christy, you um, published this prediction back in the year 2000. 2000. We submitted it in 2000. It didn't actually make press until 2002. That's a commentary on publication in today's world, but yes. Over the last 10 or, 10 or 12 years, have you made significant changes in the way you anticipate <clears throat> So, um, I have learned a lot over the last 10, 15 years. Um, for California, I would change almost nothing, it turns out. Um, you, I have experimented. I'm walking up the I have a third earthquake. <laughs> oh my gosh. Sorry. So, um, um, anyway, so I, I have experimented with other, for example, using magnitude twos and above. You don't gain much. So, I've looked at the information gain that you get from using different, um, uh, different magnitudes, different scales, different bin sizes. We, we bin these down into a grid, for example, about 10 kilometers to a side in California. It turns out that there are looking at other areas. So I've learned, I would say I've learned almost nothing. I've changed almost nothing anyway in California. What I have learned is that the first estimate we have to get probably as good as you're going to do. What I have learned also though, um, looking at other areas like Canada, is that, um, is that there are a couple of things that matter a lot here. One is that you need to be collecting data pretty completely. If you have holes in your data, because it's strictly a data-based estimation technique. So if you have holes in your data, you won't do well. For example, the reason we have those two misses, number seven and eight, is because we don't collect earthquake data in the ocean. So the networks are sparse, the networks are thin on the coast. And that means we didn't collect, we don't we haven't collected enough data to to allow us to properly look at those areas. And so that's something that has to be done if you can actually publish this to, if you were gonna send this out to the public, you would include in it an error estimation associated with what your network coverage looks like. Um, second, I have learned that in some places like Eastern Canada, which are more sort of which are more slow moving than um, California, which in which the tectonic rates are much slower, the plate motion is much slower, the stress rates are much slower, that you have to um, use larger larger bins, larger areas, and larger time steps to really see anything. Um, um, so I've learned that the tectonic area makes a difference. You have to kind of tailor it to the particular physics of the region. But other than that, it hasn't, you know, significantly changed much at all. Yes. What about, like, because that's like a, you know, San Andreas is a strike slip, slip type situation. Yep. What about that versus subduction? Like, you know, I guess there's different nuances <coughs> in terms of having smaller quakes and procedures. Yes. So, so there again, um, in place, so I, I had a student who did a lot of work with the Taiwanese catalog, for example. And in Taiwan, um, you can do quite a good job at this as well. Um, there's, there's two problems with subduction zones, but in Taiwan you can do quite a good job because the data is, again, pretty good. Um, you don't have to use magnitude threes. They produce enough events that the, the smaller the magnitude you go, the more noise you get because the networks aren't that good at collecting small, um, small data, um, small magnitude data. 
Um, and so you get more noise if you drop down to smaller magnitudes. Um, so in Taiwan, you're better off. They collect enough data and they have enough earthquakes of magnitude 4 that you can actually do this with a magnitude 4 estimation. So that is one of the things that I did learn. The other problem with subduction zones is they're noisy because they're three-dimensional. So, um, so the subduction zones, zone, if you look at it, this is a two-dimensional map, right? And it's a two-dimensional system. And in some place like Taiwan, you have you really have to do a three-dimensional map, which the student did and again did quite a good job with it. Um, in some places like Western Canada, our problem is, is that we don't collect, we don't have enough network, networks out over the ocean subduction plate, and as a result, we don't collect data from deep enough yet to do, there's a lot of errors, so you have to use a lot of missed data with depth in Western Canada, and that's one of the problems with the subduction zone is you're going to have to do, we are, if we're going to do this on a regular basis in a place like that, we're going to have to have better depth. Any other questions for Anton? Yes? Well, just maybe in terms of the GPS technology, when they're talking about the Tohoku earthquake, yep. and supposedly the Japanese had all these GPS readings of pressure buildup in that subduction zone. Mm -hmm. and the earthquake took place. But, you know, and then they're saying the second biggest mm -hmm. area of buildup is off that northern island where Sapporo is, that's the northern yep. part of Japan. Like, how about that technology in terms of forecasting using GPS technology? Um, so I'm actually going to use some GPS technology at the end of this talk if you want to see it. Great. So maybe wait till then and I'll discuss GPS. GPS is also somewhere a whole different topic. So this is a forecast I did. Actually, I showed this to Paul, I think, um, back in 2004 or five. Um, this is a forecast I did back then. This is actually, excuse me, I keep forgetting there's no um, points on this. The um, um, top map is noisy. And again, using some of the techniques I learned, I denoised it. So the bottom one is um, much less noisy, and it's the map we've been using, the technique and the map we've been using for Eastern Canada ever since. You can see, in general, again, the blue circles show you locations of earthquakes that were that occurred after the forecast started. The um, yellow and orange, again, are, are forecast locations, locations where we forecast earthquakes. And again, interestingly, um, and again, there's the location of the Ottawa earthquake in 2010, and we do forecast that correctly as well. I have a more detailed version of that if anybody wants to see it, but I left it out of this talk just for the um, sake of space. But we do forecast the, uh, that Ottawa earthquake quite well. Um, and we also, again, produce um, no false negatives except the one in Hudson's Bay, and that one, um, uh, not Hudson's Bay, excuse me, in Lake Huron, in Georgian Bay, and that one occurred. Uh, that's an area where, again, we just don't collect any data. We don't have, until very recent years, we haven't had networks up in that area, so we don't have a good record there. So again, this is about, this is again one miss in about 12 earthquakes, which again is about the same rate we were getting for California, two in 40, one in 12, one in 15. Again, this is just a discussion of where we are today with earthquake forecasting. So those maps were produced 10 years ago, and I like to tell people that 10, 15 years ago, when, when those maps were produced, we were told, when we went to publish it, you don't want to do that because nobody forecasts earthquakes. Just not done. And now today, 12 years later, there are actually agencies and organizations out there that not only take our forecast, but other seismicity-based forecasts, so other forecast techniques that use the same idea. Small earthquakes tell us something about big earthquakes. They may do the math differently, but that's the principle they, they use, the same principle. They're going to use that seismicity data to make their own forecasts, and there are now agencies like the Collaboratory for the Study of Earthquake Predictability out in California, which actually evaluates those forecasts one against the other. So there's now enough of them out there that you can even put together um, a group of different forecasts and see which one, how they perform relative to each other. Some people see that as a contest. I like to see that as an opportunity, opportunity to figure out which ones are doing better and then why they're doing better. What, what's different about them that makes them better and how can we improve all of them? But that's, not everybody sees it that way, I agree. Is there a possibility of ensemble modeling? Like we there, do in climate? So there's a, there are two possibilities for ensemble modeling in this. One is to do, yes, to stack them all up and average them out and try to do some kind of ensemble modeling. The other is actually model the earthquake fault system and produce statistical models of large events over a couple hundred years and then and then do these techniques on those and compare them for the two t potential types of ensemble models. But yes, there is. That's a very good question. Yes? Did the U.S. Geological Survey start a more active program on forecasting and the Canadian not start a more active? <coughs> 
No, I, I would say that the U.S. So the USGS really hasn't um, done anything with forecasting. Um, a number of them um, participate in this collaboratory, which is run by the Southern California Earthquake Center, which is, is, is affiliated with US, USGS, but it's not the USGS. Um, um, they run this uh, uh, earthquake predictability study, and there's now a worldwide, actually, group that does the same thing. Um, but um, the USGS themselves has not taken part in that, um, per se. There are a number of them come to the meetings and talk and, and discuss, but there's no formal program. I will talk a little bit about that possibility, though, in a couple of slides as well. Tom Jordan and Lucy Jones. So Lucy Jones, um, actually, that's a, a, an appropriate question because Tom Jordan effectively is the head of the Southern California Earthquake Center. Um, Lucy Jones was the head of the USGS um, for many, many years. Um, she's a woman effectively responsible for the great shakeout. California, which is so popular now, that exercise. The two of them published a paper a few years ago in one of the leading journals that basically said, gave you that second statement. Data other than seismic even considered in earthquake forecasting, things like geodetic measurements and geoelectrical signals, but so far none of them have, qual have qualified um, as a good forecasting technique. And I, I have, um, have paraphrased praise there. Accordingly, our focus, and focus of almost all the community that does earthquake forecasting today is on seismicity-based methods that are enabled by high-performance seismic networks. So exactly what I told you. Okay. They published that in 2010. This exponential increase in data has been allowed us to do, to do what is the basis for our method and what I really think is the physical basis for all of these methods, and that is to say that seismicity is some measure of stress. So we're actually going to try and think about it in a physical term. And I'm going to talk a little bit about operational earthquake forecasting because that's directly related to this idea of L'Aquila, so, or the problem that occurred in L'Aquila. The collaboratory for the study of earthquake predictability, again, looks at these seismicity-based methods and tries to compare them. Um, they also believe that that agency exists, organization exists, and many looked at this and agreed that short and intermediate term models demonstrate some probability gain. How much that is is still up for argument, but there's some probability gain, some information you're getting in forecasting future earthquakes relative to the long-term time-independent hazard models. So those are those hazard, hazard maps. We call those time-independent. 50 years, they're constant over that 50 years. We're talking about some kind of time-dependent model that you could update on a regular basis. That's what an operational earthquake forecast would be. Again, the goal is to provide the public with considered useful information on that time-dependent seismic hazard. And the challenges associated with this, that in my opinion, the real impetus behind what's moving that, that program forward today is the Lackawanna earthquake of 2009. So that earthquake occurred in April of 2009. It was a magnitude 6.3. Italy is subject to earthquakes of this size. It's not it's not an unusual occurrence there. They're not <coughs> rare events. Um, and they almost always cause a fair amount of damage. In this particular case, there were 300 dead, $2.5 billion in damages, and 20,000 buildings destroyed, 40,000 homeless people. Um, and again, you can see the sheer magnitude of that devastation. However, was a problem here. In early 2009, before the earthquake occurred from almost January on, seismic activity increased. They had what were called foreshocks or swarms, swarms of smaller events but that people could feel okay, and that worried them. Now again, Italy is prone to swarms. This is not an unusual problem. Many of those swarms occur and no large earthquake occurs afterwards. What didn't help the problem was there was a technician who worked for one of the local laboratories who um, like to make earthquake predictions based on radon emissions. And it certainly is, has been, radon emissions have been studied in the past associated with earthquakes. The reason we don't have a lot of radon monitors out to look for earthquake, to, to look for precursors to, to potential earthquake spikes in radon gas before the earthquake occurs is that radon gas can be released by a lot of things like high rainfall. Radon is effectively something that's absorbed in the groundwater. And so if you have changes in water, in the, in the groundwater, the local water table, you can have changes in radon. So you get an awful lot of false positives associated with radon. So nobody considers a particularly reliable method for earthquake forecasting. 
However, he did have this instrument and he liked to do this work and he issued predictions and they even evacuated the school based on one of them, I believe. Um, and they, but they were almost all, all false alarms. He did again predict one before the actual earthquake happened, but the earlier two were false alarms. But again, there was a lot of widespread concern. <clears throat> the National Commission uh, um, for the Prevention of, of, of um, um, prote Civil Protection issued um, studied this, they were supposed to, and they studied the possibility that there was going to be a large earthquake, and they came out with um, a statement that said there's no reason to say that the sequence of events of low magnitude can be considered precursory to a strong event. And then, of course, this large event did occur. A year ago, seven scientists and other experts were indicted on manslaughter charges for allegedly failing to warn residents sufficiently before that earthquake had settled in central Italy in 2009. Now, I like to point out there are two problems with two reasons that I think this occurred. One is that um, it is general government policy to state that it is not possible to forecast earthquakes. If you go to any website for the USGS, they will tell you that. Okay, and the, despite the fact that there are agencies and people who do do this and believe that there is some probability gain, some information to be gotten from these forecasting techniques that we have, the reason they do that in my opinion, is because once they say that publicly, they will have to put together a program to do it. And that's not an easy job. I am incredibly sympathetic, okay? I don't want, I don't go out in the public and tell them where and when I think earthquakes are going to occur because communication with the public is not my specialty. And the last thing I want to do is cause a panic or cause the average human being's house price to go down Okay, or anything else associated with that. And those things have happened in the past, particularly associated with volcanoes. So this is a big concern of government agencies. They need to figure out how to communicate that risk in the proper, reasonable way so that the correct behaviors occur on the public, by the public, right? And so as a result, they generally take the policy that there isn't any real way to forecast earthquakes, so therefore we don't know anything. I would say, again, I printed here what the judge said about them. He basically felt that they were um, irresponsible, I think. Um, they gave inexact, incomplete, and contradictory information. And it is certainly true that they um, um, did not communicate, again, properly. They tried to reassure the public rather than give the, the public um, reasoned information. And I think that was a mistake they made. Last month, those seven were convicted and sentenced to time in prison. Um, in Italy. And um, I would say that I think it's, uh, from my own personal view, people ask me this, and I've said this um, in the press before, I think that um, earthquake forecasting is incredibly difficult. We are told all the time it can't be done. And therefore, to convict people who were trying to do the best they knew how at the time and put them in prison for that is, um, uh, is both sad and unfair. But um, again, I'm was also in L'Aquila, and I didn't have 300 friends die. So I have to say this. I, I realize that I'm pretty far away from it when I say that. What really happened? We know that foreshocks are one of those patterns that have long been recognized and studied, studied as potential earthquake precursors. Swarms, foreshocks, small events which occur before big events. We do know scientifically that there have been places where we see those. Okay, where we see after the fact, when we go back and look, we see that there were foreshocks. They do not occur all the time. They also are very hard to see. They are particularly hard to see before an earthquake occurs. You can see a swarm, but until that big event occurs, you don't know for sure that it was, uh, they were precursors. They were a foreshock to a main shock. So you're, you never actually know with 100% certainty before the earthquake happens. We know that less than half of the large earthquakes studied to date have had detectable foreshocks, and less than 10% of earthquakes worldwide are followed by something larger within 10 kilometers in three days. So again, it's a very hard forecast to make when you're sitting there ahead of time. In Italy, seismic storms are relatively common, and they happen very, very often, and there's no large earthquake afterwards. So again, they hadn't really taken into account the statistics, but the odds are good that even if they had said there is an increased probability of event, they would have said it is a small percentage increase, 1%, less than 1%, a couple of percent, 
something on the order. There's an increased likelihood, but that increase is, only, is very small. What the public would have done with that, what, what might have been done with that would have been things like um, um, make sure your emergency kit is up to date, make sure you've got water, make sure you've got a, a charged cell phone, make sure you've got a radio, make sure you've got canned goods. Those kinds of things are what should have been done. Nobody would have been evacuated based on, on that, even on that kind of data, even if we'd done, been able to do forecasting ahead of time. We certainly think, I certainly think that the forecast consistent with this understanding was not communicated properly to the public. And, was, and then the other problem was that there were all these amateur predictions out there, this radon gas prediction out there as well. That doesn't help the communication process, right? It, it only confuses the public and makes them more worried. The point here is that operational earthquake forecasting, if it's going to be done properly, is going to have to quantify the increased probability and how you communicate it to the public. <clears throat> Again, most modern societies mandate, require in some way, that the best available, available science be used to estimate earthquake hazards. If that means there's a some like there's, there is a possibility that you could provide more information about the near-term, intermediate-term, and long-term seismic hazards, then you should do that. Again, most people don't use, most governments don't use seismicity-based forecasting techniques to, to, to add to their information, get, uh, the information they have on earthquakes, but we think that that will change. And I think, I think it's going to have to change. For example, the USGS has proposed a program to establish a prototype operational earthquake forecasting activity in Southern California. This would be along the lines of watching the seismicity as it, as it develops and then issuing, figuring out how to issue warnings which were something like there is an increased probability in the next two weeks, a 1% increase in the probability of an earthquake in the next two weeks, something like that. It would almost certainly be short term, days to weeks, and low probability gains on the order of 1%. The short-term forecast, it is very difficult with short-term forecasting to come up with, with higher probabilities. If you can look out two to three to five to ten years, you can do better with your probabilities. You can do better with your increase in probabilities. But it, because there's such a variability in, in, in seismicity, that because the numbers go up and down so much, then the actual probability gain you get is smaller. Again, this is that forecast for Toronto that I told you we did a couple of years ago. This was a five-year seismicity-based forecast. Uh, sorry, for Ottawa, excuse me, I'm standing in Toronto, that's fine. For Ottawa. And so again, you can see from the green star that that's where the Ottawa earthquake occurred. If you, this was done in uh, about, again, 2005, um, 2006. And again, you can see, this is again based on um, some improved data, so some improved ability to clean the data that I've, that I've done in the last few years. But again, um, you can see that there are some increase, the red squares are increased probability, and those increased probabilities occur all the way out to St. Lawrence, um, near Ottawa and Montreal, mostly. If we actually want to think about mitigating loss in, Cal in Canada, then we have to think about where those earthquakes are going to occur near our biggest cities. Okay. On the right, I show you a plot of the the contribution to seismic risk in Canada from our urban centers. Vancouver is first, Montreal is second. Um, uh, there are a significant probability for earthquakes of magnitude five and six in Montreal, and it's an older city with um, uh, older infrastructure. The actual damage associated that would occur there wouldn't, would not be small under a major earthquake. And the map on the left shows my seismic data from 2005 for Eastern Canada. And this is an update, uh, is to be part of the updated seismic hazard maps for um, Eastern Canada um, that are supposed to come out in the next, uh, may, they may be out already, but they were supposed to come out sometime in the next couple of years. So again, you can see this is again an acceleration, a map of, a, of spectral acceleration for um, Eastern Canada, all up and down the, the St. Lawrence region. So Christy, hmm? Quebec City, although it has greater, it has to have greater PGA, um, it's also it's because no one lives around there. Is that, it's all about concentration of hazards. So it's all about concentration of hazards. It's all about concentration. It's all about exposure, really. That, at least this plot is all about exposure. Okay. Uh, Ottawa, Ottawa and Hull, again, it's 
a lot more people there, and there's a significant hazard seismic risk in Ottawa, as you can see there. And again, um, uh, Toronto has much less because there's less seismic risk here, but um, Quebec has about almost the same because it's closer to the seismic risk, but less infrastructure. This is the result of a microzonation micro study in eastern Canada done by um, Darius Monazadian. Of course, this is in 2010, and many of you have probably seen this. This is where we go out and we try and figure out what is the ground conditions. Because if you really want to know how these earthquakes are, what kind of damage they're going to cause, you, gotta, you have to know what the buildings are built on. Ground shaking is a function not just of the size of the earthquake and how close it is, but of what kind of soil that building is sitting on. So these are, uh, this is a microzonation study in which, we try, in which um, Darius has studied the ground conditions all over Ottawa in this case. And we are working on those for Montreal, and this is an early result from some work by Gail Atkinson in the same project, the Canadian Seismic Research Network, for spectral acceleration in Montreal. From those microzonation maps, you can, you can make estimates of potential ground shaking. In this case, this is um, peak spectral acceleration for felt events in, um, on the left, and on the bottom is frequency. And again, you can see that these, these values have changed over the years as we've collected more data. So she shows here that, for example, in 2012 to 2011, the intensities, um, the peak spectral acceleration is actually going to be lower than what we would have estimated even just a couple of years ago. Is that measurement error or a change in rank? Now, a lot of it is um, additional data acquired. Again, uh, a data acquired on, on the ground and about the ground. Have you seen that brand new research on about a week old on the Virginia State? Eastern earthquake uh, ground attenuation is much farther and stronger yeah. than they were. Yeah. And, that's, and that's actually not um, a surprise, really. Um, or for example, um, in when uh, the New Madrid earthquakes occurred in the early 1800s, that was south of here, effectively, mm -hmm. near Memphis, north of Memphis, um, the, um, uh, the shaking was felt to set up a thousand, about a thousand, that, which wouldn't happen in California. So it's simply a function of the ground type of the of the the, the harder ground that the harder rock the type that it's passing through. That's the that's the first order effect that happens. Um, these are shake maps that we then make. So this is, for example, from the Plattsburgh earthquake that was now called the Osable Forks earthquake. But I spent a lot of time as a child in Vermont, and I still call it the Plattsburgh earthquake. I was in Montreal at the time. We felt that in Montreal when this occurred in 2002. It was a magnitude five, in, again northern Vermont. Well, on the New York side of the New York Vermont border, the star there near, near Plattsburgh. And um, um, the colors, colors here are the intensity, how much shaking was felt. So this is approximately a intensity five, which meant that people were shaken up pretty good. There would have been some damage um, associated with it, some significant damage associated with it. And um, this is an actual shake map, okay, from uh, that was created from that earthquake. But the goal of my research with Gail and people like Darius is to take those locations of future events that I create, that I come up with from my forecast, and then make virtual or estimated theoretical shake maps for places like Montreal using the information that Gail Atkinson has and the information that Darius Motosadian has about how the ground responds to those earthquakes. And um, this, for example, is a location of potential earthquakes near locations, potential earthquake locations, potential earthquake locations near Montreal. Excuse me for the redundant title. Um, I did this this past spring, actually, um, past summer. Um, uh, possible um, locations or sets of locations, and what I've done, what actually, and what's really interesting here is that um, we think the largest events that might occur are those which are strung together. So if you Really wish I had a I do have a So if you look at this set here, for example, and this set here, we believe that these are, are the most likely locations to string together to a larger event. So you can string these together and these as well. These we think are either noise or simply small isolated events, which will not will turn out to be larger and more damaging. And in Bentley Montreal, which is of course here, um, is closest to these two at their largest. So the idea is to take these two, the next figure shows, create rupture models. Again, using my technique, I create a potential rupture model or a potential size 
an actual fault length that might be associated with these. Again, might be associated with these. And we're going to look at probabilities, how likely they are to occur. That's a different question. But if they occurred in the next five years, this is if they occur in the next five years, we think this is the likely size of those events. And again, fault length is directly related to magnitude. So you can take these sizes, these areas, okay, the, the actual spatial length of these faults, and you can estimate what the magnitude of that event will be. And so you do that, and you're going to create, in theory, a shake map that looks like, and I should have put it here, a shake map for Montreal that would look like this. Based on those earthquakes, how we, what kind of shake map would you get? And to be honest with you, I have a student this week doing that. It was unfortunate that she's not going to finish it. She didn't finish it before I actually showed up here. I hope to show it to you. But she's working on those now. We want to put them together for a poster I'm giving next month in December in, uh, in San Francisco um, for a presentation at a big conference there um, and to show what kind of ground shaking we would get in Montreal based on if this earthquake actually happened in the next five years. And of course, we'll associate a probability with that ground shaking as well. That will be the first time we've, met, we've done that yet for uh, Canada. Actually, it will be the first time we've done that anywhere in the world. Um, this is a map just so you can see of all the historic large events in eastern Canada. Um, um, again, the 7.2 Grand Banks event in 1929. Um, we know that there have been 5.5, 6.2s. Again, the 5.9 Saguenay event, which happened out here. Again, these are all of concern. And again, these relatively um, large magnitude 5 and above thrust events, which have all occurred here near Montreal, and again, are in locations associated with those two that I just showed you. This is the Queen Charlotte Island earthquake, October of, 2000, uh, October of 2012. It was about a magnitude 7.7. .7. It was a thrust event. That's actually um, uh, a bit of a surprise. Much of the faulting in um, the Queen Charlotte is strike slip faulting, not all of it. But um, the nature of this thrust event um, the, I think was one of the reasons why there was not initial concern about a tsunami. Again, it, it, tsunami generation isn't as expected from this part of, of the western coast as an earthquake down, as, as the automatic response to an earthquake down by um, Vancouver Island would have been. So if this occurred, earthquake had occurred down by Vancouver Island, we would have been, the community would have immediately looked in immediately would have been much more concerned about the possibility of a tsunami. Not that they weren't concerned, I don't mean to say that, but um, it, it probably was, I, it, I, I cannot say, of course, what people were thinking at the time, but I think that it's one of the reasons why it was immediately um, put out to the public that there was a risk of um, This is a forecast we just used, so Paul kindly reminded me this morning that he's seen this before. Um, this one, I apologize, I have not, uh, I could not find in my hard drive this morning um, the map I have with the actual um, geography on it, the actual uh, coastline on it. I do have one, and I don't know where it is at the moment. Um, but this we we put, we did this in 2004, and I gave this at a talk I think um, that following year here in the in this particular workshop series. Um, this is a map again of potential seismic locations, and this is the noisiness that I talked about <coughs> that's associated with the subduction zone. So I am. You know, full disclosure here, I didn't cut this up. Excuse me. I didn't cut this so that you can see all the noise. Um, it is noisy in a subduction zone, and that's the reason is we're stacking up all these earthquakes with depth. So in order to do a proper forecast using seismicity in a subduction zone, you really have to do it in three dimensions and look at slices through all of these so they clean up nicely. Okay. But when you get further up north, you don't, as I said, it, it converts into more of a strike slip regime, more something more two-dimensional like California, and you don't have that noise problem in the north. And so, again, this is the location of that 7.7 um, .7 Queen Charlotte Island earthquake um, in October. And um, as you can see, um, we did uh, accurately forecast the location of that event here, even with this two-dimensional. Is, is Vancouver, Victoria showing here? Vancouver, Victoria is down. So this is the island? No, I'm sorry. I have to go back. Excuse me. Um, the tip of the island. Yes, yeah, so it's oh, excuse me again, correct my fault. Like this. 
Um, yeah, Vancouver, Victoria is down off the bottom here. So Vancouver is at about 40, yeah, it would be in here. If I recall correctly, most of what you had been talking about when you presented here about the forecast of mm -hmm. DC risk was exactly where the earthquake came and that you were less concerned over the near term than Vancouver and Victoria would get hit. Yes, and that's exactly right. In Vancouver and Victoria, we see um, this particular model shows a, this sort of variety of events out here. These will change. Um, as I do this every year or two, looking at the data as it accumulates, um, these anomalies move around a bit. I uh, have historically found that moving anomalies usually mean not reliable anomalies. There's not any persistent seismicity in one location that's telling us there's a stress change building up. Um, and so while there um, is, there's always some concern, for example, in places like Delta and Richmond, um, um, there hasn't been any persistent suggestion, suggestion that there's a persistent um, um, location that's looking to happen. Here, if we go back to Eastern Canadian seismicity again, just to um, show you one more time where the seismicity lines up again between Ottawa and uh, Montreal, and then here to the north near Quebec. Um, I do that because I was going to talk a little bit, just to finish about, um, I'm not quite sure what time, oh, I am just about finishing, GPS velocities. Um, so we do actually record, um, we have a, a network that records GPS in, in um, Eastern Canada, and these are the stations here. They're not all Eastern Canada, some of them are in the U.S. and New England. You can put these together and you can create a map, a nice clean map, once you do a lot of work on it, that's what we did in this paper, was a lot of work which shows you um, the horizontal motion that is not related, any, everything that's not related to the plate motion. This is with plate motion subtracted. The horizontal motion in eastern, along the eastern seaboard, let's just say, eastern Canada, the eastern seaboard of the U.S. Sorry, why, why is that motion happening? Is this, uh, um, we believe that this age? is, yeah, we, we believe this is predominantly due to the up, the up, the uplift associated with the glaciers. That's the big signal here. That's the horizontal post-glacial rebound. So this is not the up signal. You can get that very easily. That's big. This is small, and it's hard to get at. And, and this is really the first publication that, that suggests that it's a, a clear, coherent signal. And you can actually pull this um, horizontal GPS motion out as a as a as a as a preton uh, moves up, it pulls back at the same time. So this happens. David Eaton once told me that they believed that most of the rebounding is done is finished. Is that true? Yeah, quite well. Maybe compared to what it used to be. But so you still get as much as six to eight millimeters per year up a Hudson Bay. It's the big so. um, from I should say that from GPS velocities you can create what we call strain maps. And this was created by um uh Kumidol in two thousand and twelve. This is for California, this is not um Canada. Um, and this is actually hard, pretty hard to do. This is the first time anybody's ever used, excuse me, GPS data. Um, to, they've used GPS data, so uh, vector data, to create a map of what the deformation field on the ground ought to be, how the, how the ground is twisting and turning, okay, as, as those plates move, okay? Um, and again, it's not a simple calculation. It's not simple to do. We then took our map from this and did the same thing. So we created a what we call a strain map, or a map here on the bottom of how the, um, the earth here in eastern Canada might be torquing, twisting and turning as a result of that GPS. Now, my postdoc who actually did this work likes to remind me, there's not very much data there and there's not really enough years, so it needs a lot more work. There's probably still a fair amount of error in this, okay? But again, well, I'm pretty excited to even see that we can do it and to see that in general, you can see that that strain does match up pretty well here along the ottawa bonshire Graben and all this seismicity. This is just seismicity that occurs between Ottawa and Montreal. And then, of course, again, just a bit to the, <coughs> excuse me, to the east and to the north. And then up the St. Lawrence, and you can see that, that some of that value is higher here where you would expect it to be. Again, the ground is moving in response so the seismicity or the seismicity is occurring in response to the whatever is making the ground torque, but they're related to each other. And you can see that for the first time. This one here is, in my opinion, the most unreliable. This is the edge of the network. If you remember that GPS network that we looked at, um, I could go back and show it to you. If you remember, this is down here is really the edge of that network. And so it's, this is, may just be an edge effect 
from the calculation. So I'm not sure that this is a, a, a true signal. If you want to, now if I can, I can make a map of the seismicity rate changes with those same sort of PI anomalies that I made before, I can make it in two scales using magnitudes 4 and magnitudes 3, just as I did earlier. And if I plot those up against this, okay, you can see that, for example, I get that same long wavelength pattern running north and south, or again, this is just cleaned a bit, running um, north, north, west, south, east between Ottawa and Montreal, and again, in this case, if I use magnitudes 4, I don't get this anomaly here, I get a small one here, and again, so I'm still a bit suspicious of whether this is either as big as it appears to be here, or if it's there at all, and so we need more data. We have some new GPS, relatively new GPS stations, which um, I've been collecting data at here in the Toronto area over the last um, six or seven years, and that data we will add in next and see. Um, if we can actually get a better, a, a, what we believe be a more accurate map of this. So this is, of course, within the North American plate. So mm -hmm. this is the PGR post-glacial rebound, that I guess come decompression from the glacier. Right. Oh, and, and potentially associated strain. So, so what people generally believe is the reason we see, let me go back for a sec, the reason we see all this seismicity here is because there's some kind of weaker area here. So the, you know, there's a lot of a lot of movement going on at the edges of the plate, a lot of pushing and shoving and stressing and straining and, you know, just shoving at the edges of the plates. Eventually, that all kind of gets transferred to the center of the plate. I mean, it's a big thing, but eventually, over time, it, some of those stresses work their way in, internally into the, um, into the plate itself, into the center of the plate. And we, so we do sometimes get earthquakes here, big ones like the New Madrid earthquakes of, the early 1800s, for example, or moderate size events, which we get here along um, the St. Lawrence Seaway. Many people believe that the St. Lawrence Seaway is a relict um, weak zone, a relict um, uh, expansion or rifting area, rift, that's in a relict rift area that occurred under one of those old plate tectonics things where they pull apart and crash together, pull apart and crash together. So it's an old weak zone, and that the earthquakes cluster there earthquakes that need to occur in order to sort of relieve the relative motion from those those plates at the edges, they cluster, oh, excuse me again, sorry, they cluster in these areas because that it's a weaker area, right? And some people, and, and for example, down by New Madrid, there is actually um, what's called the real foot rift zone there, and that's another, what they think is an ancient rift that didn't, either didn't finish or got smushed back together again in one way or another. Smush is a technical term. Yeah. Um, so, um, so that's, of course, within a plate and explaining yes. it. With, now, taking the technology for, let's say, Western Canada, mm -hmm. so the, the Japanese example, right? Yes. In terms of, so what, how far are we, probably we've seen the California map, which, which is really detailed. We actually look up, you know, get a yes. magnifying glass to figure it out. How close are we doing something like that in Western Canada? Um, so I have to say that I haven't, so I, we, so I, let's start with this. My, the colleagues I, ha I, I know out in Western Canada that do GPS work, they do some of the finest work in the world. They have some of the best, most quality networks that exist. And worldwide, they're universally admired for that work. They, for example, um, identified what's now called episodic tremor and slip um, for the first time ever because they, um, um, they were the first to ever see that because they have that exceptional GPS network. They're, the biggest, so the biggest um, stumbling block to create a map like this out there is again the number of stations and how dense they are. So here, if you look, if I look, show you back again, um, here we have um, effectively 34 stations, 34, 35, okay, a couple dozen stations here in eastern Canada. And I told you that as it is. I'm suspicious of, I mean, I, you have to take that, that's maybe not quite enough here, okay, in order to actually produce a nice dense map. I can't nearly, for example, I can't get a, a map anywhere near as dense as what they do in California. They have a similar problem in, in the, on the West Coast. If you want to produce a dense strain map, you have to have a, a fair number of stations and, um, and a particular density of stations to get that, and that's, um, that currently doesn't exist in the West, at least not probably to the, now, if you wanted longer spatial scales, you could certainly produce something like this. Again, how accurate it would be, they would be much more uh, adept, and they would be much more expert in telling you that and answering that question. The, um, the, 
bigger, the, actually the, the more interesting thing out west is that they um, certainly do a good enough job to look for um, uh, rate changes, changes in how fast the plates are moving, ch change how fast the plates are moving relative to each other, whether they're locked or not locked everywhere, any changes in that locking. Those are the kinds of things that they can produce, and, and that is the kind of thing that really the Japanese also have looked for and done. And so certainly we can do that. We can do those kinds of things that the Japanese did on the West Coast. We can't do um, strain maps probably particularly well, although I would never presume to say they couldn't do anything because they're, as I said, pretty good at what they do. Very good at what they do. And since the subduction zones off the coast, of, like, how does it do with bodies of water, you know? Like, do you have to actually have all these sort of GPS detectors, like, you know, you, you're at, you're at the, you, you go sort of east of the subduction yes. zone. You have to actually have this entire Pacific Ocean kind of full of, like, how does it work? What's the logistics of something like that? So, um, in subduction zones, so, 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 so let's start with the, the first order rule is that if you want to see um, with, with GPS, is if you want to see an act, um, a motion, an activity that occurs, a physical, a physical source that occurs um, over a scale that's, say, 30 kilometers wide and 30 kilometers deep, you need spacing of 30 kilometers on your, um, on your network, at least, or smaller. So, so the... The shallower you go, actually, the denser the shallower the effect, the denser the, the denser the network has to be. You want to see deeper stuff. You actually can get away with longer wavelengths because it creates a bigger spatial signal on the surface. Does that make sense? If you push it from further down, you're going to get a you push it more, and you push it from further down, you get a bigger expression, a wider expression on the surface of the Earth, and that means you can get away with a less dense network. And so. For example, the subduction zone runs under um, Vancouver Island. They have a very nice network on Vancouver Island itself, and there they measure a good. That's where they measure a good deal of the uplift and the relative motion. And then they have a uh, a network that is a bit less dense as it moves back into British Columbia again, because the, the signal tails off the further away you get from the subduction zone. Um, the, of course, there are no GPS instruments out in the ocean. There are such a thing as ocean bottom GPS um, uh, receivers. And it is possible to, what, what you do is you dump one on the bottom of, don't, don't dump anything, you put one on the bottom of the ocean and then you have a little antenna that runs up to the surface um, and that antenna, um, and, and that antenna is what records the GPS satellite locations and tells you, it'll, it really what it, it tells you is where the antenna is, but if you know how the distance between the antenna and the GPS instrument, you know where it's, um, um, you know where the, the instrument is and how much it's moving. The issue is they're expensive. They're expensive to deploy. They're expensive to maintain. And um, with GPS data, you have to have a lot of measurements in order to um, to bang the noise down. GPS is very noisy. That's something they don't tell you when they sell sell you your GPS, right? Um, it's and your little handheld. It, GPS is very very noisy data. And as a result, um, it, in order to do the kind of measurements you need to measure to accurately identify deformation due to plates, due to tectonics, you have to take lots of measurements, like one every 15 seconds or one every second. And then you, you take them all day long and you average them down and you get one measurement per day. And then you take one measurement per day and you average that down over a year and you get a velocity, right? So um, and that was to be honest with you, how GPS was first done, how it was first made successful for, for what we do. Very successful, those things are very successful for what we made successful for what we do. And so you have, if you put an ocean bottom size monitor out, you have to put it out for a long time in order to get a good number. And so again, the cost winds up being expensive. Right? I know a couple of places in the world where they would like to do that more, like um, California. Um, along, along Cascadia in the U.S., um, on the U.S., south of the border in the U.S., they, they're there are hopes to plans that they may have got, actually gotten further with it. I haven't looked into how far they've gotten with it, but there's been talk of that. And then, of course, just the Japanese. But those are the only cases I actually know of where anybody's done any significant. And that's, again, this is the same one. And again, you can see that, for example, if we just look for a minute to finish up at the um, this location here of a potential, one of those potential rupture locations I talked about before, an earthquake that might happen, then we'll, 
saying this earthquake might happen with some probability, then creating a shaking map for Montreal. You can see that that one does occur both along in here and in this area of higher strain in up in here. And again, that's my conclusion. Exponential, the exponential increase in the collection of seismicity data, particularly small seismicity data over the past 30 years, has really led directly to the increase in our increase in the increase in our ability to provide time-dependent or earthquake forecasts, earthquake hazards. Um, we think it can be successful. I think we've proven it is successful. It can, for example, forecast large events in both eastern and western Canada. We can use these to create rupture, what we call rupture scenarios or potential earthquakes near big cities in Canada, larger cities in Canada, in order to try and figure out what the ground shaking is going to be and what the potential damage might be, what we, what we might actually be faced with when the time comes. Um, we can use these areas, we actually can relate these areas, these locations, to areas of high strain or deformation associated with potential um, uh, earthquake locations. And again, we think that these, this deformation does actually map into the seismicity itself, which is again support for our idea, for our hypothesis, that, that all of these are related to the same physical mechanism, which is the buildup or change in stress at depth. Thank you. Question? The, um, the Haida Gwaii earthquake in Charlotte event October 28th was actually pretty huge, actually, when you think about it. I, you know, I, I took a look and in, 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 if you look since 2000, since the year 2000, it, it's in the Western Hemisphere, it's second only to, to Denali in, in Alaska. So that's shocking how big that was and, and lucky. And, and so that's just off the north tip of the Juan de Fuqua plate. And then last week we had a smaller earthquake. Yeah. It was actually underneath the Juan de Fuqua plate. Yeah, I know. It's not far from Tofino. So uh, now you've talked about these smaller events as precursors to these major events, but on a global scale, these aren't major events we're interested in. So can these be precursors to the next Cascadia? Um, so I never say never. About precursors, um, yes, they could be. It could. I mean, there is a there is a there's a story you could tell in which you know strain is building up and working. At, sorry, I have I have a colleague, actually, a number of colleagues who are interested in the idea as, to, as interested in the idea that there's some larger scale process at work that's related to large um, um, subduction style events. So, for example, Chile and um, Japan, they occurred both on the edge of the Pacific Rim, on the edge of the Pacific Plate. Now. In the other place. And then in some way or other, there's some reallocation of stress on a very large scale that's happening there. Um, there are actually um, even better, more, in my opinion, more likely physical reasons why that might be happening, triggering associated with the kind of waves that pass through when these earthquakes go by, for example. Um, but we, we and, it, and you could tell a story in which this earthquake, this earthquake is, um, is occurring, and then there's some kind of migration pattern that heads further south. Um, I, I would always be very wary of doing that for two reasons. One is, um, again, we, magnitude 7.7, magnitude 8 earthquakes, magnitude 9 earthquakes, they occur so rarely. We have very poor statistics on those, okay? We do not really know a lot about even their inter-event time occurrence, much less um, the variability on that on that recurrence time. And um, and really, you, before you decided, before I was going to say whether I thought that this earthquake could be a precursor, I would have to look at the stress changes. So how are the stresses actually migrating underground? And you can do that. You can do a model for that. Migrating, and are they migrating that way? And that w that's, again, the sort of first order effect that would tell you whether or not there might be a larger event. For example, Rothstein, in, and when you talk about um, um, the Sendai earthquake in, um, in the northern part of Japan now, the Japanese islands, um, they've done, the, Rothstein and, and his colleagues in Japan have done a, a lot of work looking at the stress changes created by the Sendai earthquake and how that might be loading or unloading the areas around it, right? Um, but again, the interaction between earthquakes is very, between earthquake faults is very, very complicated. And, and again, my concern in, in 
the west coast of Canada is that while we know a lot about the fault structure, what the faults are, how big they are, how deep they are, how many of them there are in California, we know more about the actual underground fault network there than we do anywhere in the world. Um, even there we get it wrong. And we don't know um, enough about what's actually at depth here. And that's the biggest that's the biggest drawback to actually saying whether or not um, there's a triggering effect going on where they're migrating down the coast. Is it possible? Of course it's possible. So is the work that you refer to that could be done to see if the stress is transferring in a certain direction or not. Um, is anybody doing that work? Um I haven't asked anybody else if they're doing that. Um, I have considered that option, doing it. We could do that ourselves, at, for example, at Western. I've considered doing it. It wasn't until last week when the other earthquake happened that I thought about it. Um, um, the better people to do it are um, my co the people out on the West Coast. They've already done um, a fair amount of modeling of the stress field in that area, they know a lot, of, and so they already have that sort of packaged up and ready to go. Whether they're doing it or not, though, I haven't asked them. Actually, I should. So we can do it together. Can I do a variation of Daryl's question? Yep. You did some work on the Turkey mm -hmm. earthquake. Yes. And after a very large earthquake in Turkey, I thought part of your work was to say where you were now anticipating the next earthquake might be in Turkey. Mm -hmm. So the same thing. We've had the earthquake in yep. Ottawa. We've had the earthquake mm -hmm. here in Charlotte. Mm -hmm. So. With Turkey, doesn't it demonstrate you have the technique, you yeah. have what you need to do this, mm -hmm. although the data may not be the same as it is for Turkey. Right. Is that a question people want answers to? Is, right? Yeah, you, you could, so in, in Turkey, for example, you can, uh, there was a big earthquake in Turkey in 1989, and um, a couple months later, that was in August, a couple months later, an earthquake almost as big, um, literally 100 kilometers. Less than 100 kilometers, less than 100 kilometers from, from the, what we call the Izmit earthquake. There was the Izmit earthquake and the Duce earthquake. The Izmit earthquake occurred, was large, it killed many people, um, and um, was really a scandal at the time. And um, and a few months later, in November, this second earthquake occurred. And Ross Stein did some work showing that that the first earthquake could trigger the second one using these stress changes, these underground stress changes, and modeling technique, some of what I mentioned here. Um, but you can do the same thing with it. So, but I also showed that you can do the same thing with the seismicity. If you take the seismicity before do, before Ismet, um, you see the Ismet earthquake location. You see that it's going to occur. If you, but you don't see Duce. There's no there's no anomaly. There's no forecast for Duce at all. And then after the Ismet earthquake occurs, if you then look at the seismicity and you do a new analysis, you do see that Duce earthquake um, getting ready to occur. And um, um, I probably on my computer so I have those maps, um, but the, um, and it's, it's quite an interesting um, process. Again, my my concern here really is is what you're missing in terms of the missing data. You could do it, yes. And the question again is the missing is there how reliable is the answer going to be? That's always been is always my concern in Cascadia because the networks there there are very few seismic stations even in this area. Okay, there's even fewer. And then there's almost nothing in almost nothing in between until so you get to the very northern tip of Vancouver Island. And as I told, as I told you, these, this method in particular is dependent on collecting small magnitude events. And so um, I always put a plug into that when I talk to government people. Um, small magnitude events, you have to get small magnitude events. You can't get small magnitude events reliably without lots of seismometers, without a dense seismic network. And so that's... Um, that my that's my big goal, as I said when I talked to the GSC and the USGS and all those people, is that we need more seismic networks. We need to collect this data, and then you can do a really good job almost anywhere in the world, in my opinion, of of doing this kind of thing. So, but again, so it is yes, it's, a it's possible, and to it's possible that that's what's happening. B it's possible that you could study that with seismicity and with and compare it to models of stress change. You could do that. We haven't started that yet. I think it's a, probably a good idea, but I. Before I did it, contact the uh, advocate, as I said, Joe Hinton and a couple of the guys out on the West Coast have done the actual modeling in the past for stress changes on the subduction zone. And so I would ask them for their input and help and expertise. So you're not overly concerned that these latest earthquakes that we've experienced in the last month are mean Cascadia is that much closer to us? No. Okay. Questions? If I could 
can sneak in a mm-hmm. thanks. Um, yeah. Anne Benfield gave a lot of support as well. Yeah. So a thanks to Anne yeah, Benfield course, yeah. for supporting Christine's work over I the last say several years. Ninety-eight work was done um, originally. On the, I want to say Anne Benfield chair. So yeah, Thank you very much. Okay. If there's not more questions, um, uh, one from Grant here. Um, do you go back to the Eastern Canada map with the little red dots on? Mm-hmm. Have you looked at uh, the population per dot? You can no. change it to a hazard map. Oh. No, I uh, so I have a I do have um, some interest. I have a um, uh, potential um, <coughs> interest in funding a project aimed at exactly mm-hmm. to to take a look at exposure. How big are I'm adding it into? This. How big are the squares? Like These the are um, density. Yeah, this is smooth, but this density is done on a. 20 kilometers square grid, 25 kilometers square grid. Um, if you could do it smaller, um, it winds up being a little more if you do it smaller. Actually, the last question I had on this map uh, is there a geological difference? It's a lot redder on the Quebec side than the states or the Ontario. Well, Ontario is more red than the state. Is that where the you had a lot more stations in the Americas? So what's um, the geological difference between New York and Quebec? Right. So, yeah, okay, probably none, to be honest with you. In this particular case, um, the data set I use is the Eastern Canadian data set. They record earthquakes in, in so they record, earth, excuse me, they record earthquakes in New England, but they don't, um, they don't record as many of them because their stations are lined up on this side of the border. So there's a, there's a dearth of, oh, data. of data over here, really. Yeah, so there's an accuracy issue that goes with this. I really should create a, if I was doing this in a geodetic way, using geodetic data, like GPS data, this is double size system. If I use GPS data, I would almost always create a map that showed the motions and then a map that showed the error, the, the, the variance, the error on that. And so you'd have two maps right next to each other. When, and in this case, the, the potential error would be, the likely error would be higher here than it would be up here simply because of where they're collecting the data from. Again, this is, these were these were collected from Canadian size models. More accurate. So I can tell a short story on that issue. Um, the National Geographic asked a number of us to work together on preparing a map of Canada, the United States, and Mexico, and the risk of earthquakes and tornadoes and various other storms. And they took the data from the government of Canada on earthquakes and from the government of the U.S. on earthquakes, and took the two maps and put them beside each other as the National Geographic. Geographic loves to do maps, and in eastern North America, they didn't fit. And uh, on the west, they fit rather well, actually, but on the east, they didn't fit at all. And the Americans thought that there were no earthquakes <laughs> other than New Madrid, yeah. right? and the Canadians thought that there have been enough. Yeah. The, the, US, the Americans have, the U.S. hasn't, so in the U.S., there, there hasn't been enough, there, for many years, was not an official dense seismic network here. They would rely on, for example, um, Seismometers at universities, uh, Boston College, Boston University, Harvard, they would all have those seismometers. And there, there might be some government ones interspersed in between, but there wouldn't be a dense network here um, on, the, on the east side here. Now, the U.S., of course, has something called Earthscope, which is a huge project to, to densify all their networks, both GPS and, um, and uh, seismic. And they put a huge set of networks, permanent ones, out way out here on the west coast. Right, way over here. But they also created what's called the movable array, and that array has been tra- has been stepping its way across the um, continent of, the, of North America um, for the last six years or so, um, six eight years. And um, um, and every now and then somebody attaches some da- some, some networks um, from Canada to it, so we can collect something uh, smooth across the border. And I, I believe there's a program to do that. In fact, I know there's a program to do that. Through here as well, um, but um, uh, yeah. So, so I haven't. One of the things that could be done here is I could go in and I could I could get a, an American network, a U.S. network, which had it, all of the data from from New England in here for the seismic data and put it in. But my concern is that if ours is actually probably better than theirs in the old days. Maybe not now, but in the old days it might have been ours might have actually been denser and more accurate than theirs. So I'm not sure that it would actually improve this result. Okay, so if we're going to close for today, um, the, as Tracy mentioned at the beginning, the next seminar in January is going to look at uh, 
Super storms? Is that the right term? Well, that's the immediate term. <laughs> Meteorological term is hybrid storms. Hybrid storms. Storms like Sandy and trying to understand uh, what they're about and share the latest research on that topic for January. And, um, and people with ideas for seminars you'd like to see during uh, the coming year, uh, we intend to finalize our program next week. So uh, there still is a quick opening if you know somebody you'd like us to come and have a present or you know a topic that you would like us to make sure we cover next year. Uh, please be in touch with one of us in the next couple of days and uh, we'll do our best to try to uh, continue.